Thanks for tuning in to another edition of Jets FM on the OFN as we talk New York Jets NFL Draft 2024. Jan Levine's back, resident Prime Sports Network Jets FM Jets fan. How's it going, Jan? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. You got the hat. Is that the good. new logo? No, it's the old logo. Is the old new the old logo? Old logo. The old, yeah. the old. Yes. There's a, a, the, a the, little... the original. The original. Yeah, the, 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 the tiny little adjustments they made though. But just yeah, tiny. I bet you nobody, sharper, can, I, change, nobody change. knows the difference though. No, change the coloring a little bit, change the angles a little bit to make it a bit sharper in terms of the the cuts associated with it. A little different. Obviously, green is different from what it used to be to a certain extent, but. Um, Look, I mean, I think we didn't even talk, right? I mean, I happen to like the New Jerseys. I like, I like the look yeah. of the New Jerseys. I like, I like them harkening back. I mean, last year, it's also pretty interesting if you look that a lot of the teams that changed their logos with Nike have all of a sudden done a 180 and gone back to what they did previously. So, Hey, well, if it works, you know. I mean, unfortunately, sometimes – I mean, I don't know. I have no idea. I don't really remember why they, they made the change. But when they did – it was okay for a little bit, but then as it wore on, it was like, yeah, nah, this is just one of those things that you, you better up bringing them back temporarily, that kind of deal. You know, one of those retro yep. night game deals, and then they stuck with it for like what? How long was it? 20 years? 15 years that we had those yeah, old new years. ones? I think it was 20 years. Yeah. So we've had the old one. Was, we had the, the, the original, and then we changed to this. Then we went back to the original, and now we're going back to the second original. If, I don't know if, if that makes any sense. But uh, anyway, I think it's better, and I think the timing is good too, because if they would have done this last year, um, that would have been a wash. But everything's new yes. this year. So we've gotten the Aaron Rodgers injury out of the way. We've got the new uniforms. You know, This is not a game or two. This is our full uniforms for the entire season and beyond. Uh, it's been uh, an interesting off season, an interesting few days for the draft. So I have to ask you right right off the bat, give me an overall grade for the Jets' current off season. Ooh, um, I'd probably say like a B or B plus for the overall off season. Probably more than B plus range. Um, filled needs, right? We we knew offensive line was a massive weakness. Um, they filled those knees by signing Tyron Smith and John Simpson, and we'll go through the the addition of Fashanu in the draft. Um, they needed wide receivers. Uh, they brought in Mike Williams, who I think we both wanted when he got let go by San Diego. Granted, though, he's got the injury history, and he's coming off an injury now, but he certainly upgraded the talent offensively, but we all know that he's got injury problems. We needed a second quarterback. They brought in Tyrod Taylor. Um, who gives them a veteran presence as their number two. And Zach Wilson finally got moved. Um, we ended up losing um, Bryce Hall, which I think we both thought, Bryce Hall, we thought we were going to lose him, right? We thought we were both hopeful that maybe he comes back. Maybe they figure a way to get him back, but they lose him as Philly gives him a massive offer. And then on the flip side, all of a sudden, Hassan Reddick lands in their laps, right? And they get Hassan Reddick. That helps them in terms of their, their defense, Um so they, they've definitely made moves. I mean, there's definitely a couple of moves we'll go through from the draft in terms of John Franklin's Myers moving, which I'm a little concerned about the defensive line depth, but we both like one of the undrafted free agents that they added that we think could potentially be a guy who, who makes their roster. Um, but I think overall, given the needs, given the holes that needed to be filled, um, I think Douglas did a nice job in terms of filling, filling those needs. A lot of one-year deals, which I think we all expected. Uh, given the injury history of some of the guys they brought in, Smith, Morgan Moses, who's backing, like you said, old is new and new is old, right? We got Morgan Moses back, so old is new and new is old. So is another hearkening back to a guy who was here kind of previously. But I think overall, you look at the lineup, uh, you like what Douglas has done. You know he's still going to be somewhat aggressive during free during the remaining period of free agency, during training camp in case a need arises it's something that's been his mo though they do have some cap restriction part of the reason why they had to get rid of franklin myers um taking a hit in terms of zach wilson some other dead cap money so there's not an inordinate amount of flexibility but as we all know if you want to make room in the nfl just roll something into a signing bonus 
and you can make room as opposed to uh, having to hit the salary cap. So uh, Douglas has done a nice job, but granted, look, he's got his feet to the fire. I think you and I both know he's got his feet to the fire this year, coming off the last five years. Robert Sala most certainly has his feet to the fire. Our offensive coordinator, LaFleur, certainly has his feet to the fire. So the only guy who's probably in a, in a really solid position, in my opinion, is Albrecht, given what we saw from the defense, what we saw at times the defense couldn't really get off the field last year when we needed to stop. So, But he's one of those that's viewed as a rising star. So there's a lot of guys with, uh, with skin in the game and money on the line here based upon what happens. And I think Douglas has done a nice job of upgrading the talent on the roster, filling the holes – as we get set, basically, kind of to go into, um, you know, training camp down the road in July, but also having, like, the rookie camp, et cetera, just to get our first look at some of these guys. Well, I think right now the roster, uh, top to bottom, is uh, deeper than it was last year. It's better than it was last year. So, again, I think that's why you could say what you want about uh, how what last season went. I think that was the reason why uh, – Douglas needed to come back. Sala needed to come back. You know, Woody, which we talked about before, you know, Woody was as aggressive as Joe was, as Robert was to get Aaron Rodgers. He was all on board for it. So that's why he couldn't fire these guys because you just fire yourself because what are we going to blame him for Aaron Rodgers getting hurt? You were for it. So, um, but I agree. Everybody now, the leash is tighter. I think it's not as tight on Joe. Joe's done a really good job. I think now if Aaron Rodgers is healthy and the team stays relatively healthy, it's playoffs or you need you need to find a new head coach. Because if you don't have an absorbent absorbent amount of injuries this year and Aaron Rodgers is playing 16, 17 games, whatever, and you don't make the playoffs, it's a coaching problem. Then you need to bring in a new coach. Let Joe go ahead and bring in a new coach. I don't think that's going to happen. I, I think we'll be a playoff team if everybody's healthy. But that's the kind of uh, situation it's going to be for Coach Sala. Um, but as far as Douglas, uh, yes, I think it's been a very successful offseason to, to date. As you mentioned, uh, there are some uh, – there's probably about 10 free agents out there that I, I, I kind of circled that could be interesting, whether it was an injury, as you mentioned, or – look, by the way, the, the move – that the, the contract move with um, with jo- with uh, uh, Myers, Franklin Myers, that did open cap space. The Jets now have ten million dollars in cap space. So, w- what do they do with that? Now, again, they have to sign rookies, so that's going to go away. Some of that's going to go away, but you do wonder whether or not there'll be a way for them to add at least one more veteran on this team, a significant veteran. Um, so, for instance, um, I, the, the positions that I outlined were wide receiver, offensive line, uh, defensive line, and defensive backfield. So, um, these there's only two notable receivers. Well, really one, because they're not bringing Odell Beckham in here. So, that, that would be Boyd. But I think Boyd now doesn't fit because you went out and you just drafted a slot corner, and you also have Gibson. So you don't, there's no reason to have Boyd on this team unless there's an injury in training camp and he's still available. So out of these offensive linemen, um, the most obvious one is Bakhtiari, but you have Pete, Bakhtiari, and Mason Cole. Of course, uh, Beckton is still available. But out of those guys, Cole and Pete would be the most interesting because they play in the interior. And because of that, that right now, when you take a look at the Jets, what they did not accomplish this offseason or in the draft, they did not add depth in the in the middle, in the interior of the offensive line. No, I agree. Um, I think I think they've improved by bringing the guys in. I do think they need depth. Um, I mean, part of this is, right, we get to see what Max Mitchell has learned and how much he's grown. We hope Carter Warren last year from being on the team, he's had some growth. Clearly, the, the big key is his health, right? Vera Tucker... I, I would have been shocked if they didn't, you know, basically sign him for the fifth year. It would have been yeah. ridiculous and stupid if they hadn't. But unfortunately, you know, you need to be on the field. And as good as Vera Tucker is, every year he unfortunately, by some whatever type of injury, be it fluky or whatever, has it remain on the field. Um, I think we saw Tittman show some signs last year, but the jury, to a certain extent, is well, still out on him. But he's so I do think, but I do think he is he is a starter. Yeah, he's and I think starter. he's going to be a solid starter, right? Uh, I think 
Fashanu is, is learning from, look, he's talked extensively already since they brought him in, how much he loves Tyron Smith, right? And how much he wants to learn from him. So you kind of hope that Smith takes him under his wing and teaches him, right? He's got to be better at the point of attack we've seen, though from the highlights you saw just why he was um, that high of a pick overall by the Jets and, and a wise pick. I do think defensive line, like you talked about, the loss of Franklin Myers, most certainly we've talked about, right? Well, let's Guys just stick to, to the offensive up. line. Michael Cl- so, so, it, offense. It, it, so offensive line, they need help. So my opinion, actually, you said, the other piece that I'm a little concerned about, and we can go through this, I'm actually slightly concerned about tight end, right? I mean, well, losing we'll Azoma is, is, so is a safety valve, right? But, 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 but I think inside line, look, Becton, let's just say, are you surprised at all that nobody has signed Becton at all? Like, given the need for offensive linemen in this league, the fact that nobody has signed him, uh, maybe he just wants too much from somebody as, as a contract, and maybe he's expecting to get that kind of a deal. Though, given the injury history, I'm not quite sure what his agents are telling him what he's thinking. But I'm a bit shocked in a league where offensive linemen are at a premium and guys are dying for offensive linemen. A guy who still has potential yeah, sure. and still yes. sitting out there is kind of shocking. Maybe that's what it is, like you said. We don't know. We don't know what the contract situations are like because that's something we don't really care about at this point. But you're right. I mean, it is strange. He's definitely got talent. Um, but I just don't see – see, the offensive line, that is the – if I had to point to one position this offseason that they did not improve on was the depth – in the interior because what they're saying is is if Veritaka gets hurt again well uh, we're going to start relying on Wes Schweitzer and Max Mitchell again to play at guard now that might be okay as long as the rest of the offensive line's healthy and you only have like one kind of fringe guy playing a role on the offensive line but if you have multiple injuries on the offensive line including Vera Tucker now you're back almost in, in, in a situation you were like last year so that's why Pete would be the only guy or Cole that you could look at, but those guys are not coming here unless it's an injury. Um, so overall, though, I think the offensive line with Fashano being brought in uh, and the free agents, there's no question the offensive line looks a lot better than it was last year. And then what you have to look at, too, is is that in 2025, the Jets have found their starting bookends, at least we hope, with Fashano at left tackle and Carter Warren at right tackle. So I think that's the overall hope is that in 2025, you'll have Fashano, Simpson, Tipman, Vera Tucker, and Carter Warren as your starting five and all of them uh, within the prime of their careers. So I think they've done a good job as far as that's concerned. Now, as far as tight end, um, look, I mentioned this for the last month with all this Brock Bauer stuff. And I even talked about this the other day. If you take Brock Bowers out of the picture, I don't think anybody, I, I don't know, I, why on NFL.com during the draft were the top needs for the Jets tight end? I didn't think that was a top need. I thought it was a luxury pick. If you know he's the best player available and you want to take Brock Bowers, okay, that that's fine. But I just don't see how this was a need pick for the Jets based on the fact that they believe that Jeremy Ruckert is a quality starting tight end in this league, and he's going to get the opportunity to be that guy this year. So whether you or I, you know, whatever we think about that, that's what they believe. So I think we saw snippets from Ruckert last year. We saw occasional glimpses of him being that guy, right? My, my thing was I didn't necessarily – look – I love Bowers because of the versatility he provided you and the oh, way he could get down the field. And we'll yeah. go we'll go we'll go into the wide receiver room and what they've done. My view on this is you have Kenny Yabo and Zach Kuntz. Neither one of them can you rely on yet as a third tight end and don't know if you're ever going to be rely on them. They My think view so. is I thought they might add I thought they might add one late in the draft as a depth guy to bring in as a possible third tight end. And they still might in well, free they, agency yeah, but probably Kuntz. know and try to get somebody. They did that last right. year. Right. Right. But Again, they think he's come along and he is going to be a part of their number three and number four tight end group. That's what they think. I don't I don't think it's something like, oh, yeah, look, we've got Tomlinson, that character, you know, on the team. Or we have these other veteran eight year guys that they never do anything. They got two young tight ends that they believe in. So we got to keep our fingers crossed that they're as good as they think they're going to be. As we do. Yeah. Look, I'm to like Ruckert. I'm to like some signs I saw from him. I mean, Conklin had a pretty good year last year, in my opinion. Um, you know, guy, guy who we know can be an offensive guy. 
I do think, like you said, Rockard is the guy they're hoping yep. takes that next step forward. And this is honestly, without without Ozama there, uh, with CJ being gone, this is his opportunity right. to potentially become the starter. Yep. And that's uh, what I'm hoping for, that's for sure. You use up a third-round draft pick on a, on a player, any player, especially a tight end, you think he's going to be a, a big-time contributor for their team, period. So it's, it's time for him now. Uh, to show that he can be that guy, and uh, you know, and 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 it, the timing might be perfect because Aaron Rodgers is going to be under center this year, hopefully. Um, all right, now wide receiver. So uh, once again, I look at this wide receiver room, and now that they've got slot and and two starters, and Williams and Wilson, that they have a solid, very solid, above average on paper trio of wide receivers Lazard you know will be better because of Aaron Rodgers and then Gibson we know how they feel about Gibson and we also know what they feel about Brownlee and then we have saw Irvin play well on special teams matter of fact there's a lot of people who think he might be the, the number one gunner this year on special teams so he's gonna have an edge for, without question over Taylor or McCutcheon if they keep seven receivers on this team which I don't know if they will or not uh, but that's what's going to be interesting. They can always put Brownlee back on on uh, practice squad, and Irvin makes the team uh, to play a you know gunner. So I think they look at this unit, and I kind of agree and say, yeah, there's a lot of good youth. The the, the, the biggest question mark that we all are going to be dealing with is Mike Williams. That is the biggest question mark. And if he gets hurt and doesn't perform, will one of those other receivers could even be Alan Lazard? But will one of those other receivers be able to step up? Well, we know how good Garrett Wilson is. He's a stud. Alan, Alan Lazard was brutal last year, and that's putting it nicely. Yep. I mean, part of my French, he sucked. He stole money last yes. year. I mean, it's the only way to describe it. Sure. He was absolutely horrific. And I don't want to hear the excuse that it was because, because Rodgers was gone. I'm sure that was a contributing factor. But I'm sorry, you need you need to be a lot better last year. Yep. And again, they're probably keeping him because of the contract, because of Rodgers coming back. Fine. Gibson clearly was a guy who took a step forward last year, way beyond Brownlee. Brownlee, good camp. Really didn't do a ton during the regular season, even with the some opportunities he received based upon some injuries. Mike Williams, look, I he's a guy who does fantasy, right? Mike Williams is a guy who's the sexy pick who has that one big year, and then afterwards, every single year, he gets hurt, right? He's coming off an ACL tear right now. The big issue with him is he can't stay healthy. When he's on the field, he's big. He could be a monster. He's he's the perfect guy, and it was a perfect signing, in my opinion. There was no reason not to sign him, especially for what you got him for. Granted, besides the Taylor, Ham, or Pork roll, depending on your view as to the, the sandwich he got, right? But it was a really smart signing. And then you look. You know what, you know what I texted you before the draft Friday. I said, get me Malachi Conley. Get Lee. I, and again, if you look Malachi. at the tweets, Bolsey, whether or not you believe Malachi, what would you believe what, what Sal and Douglas said, no matter what, right? They were trying to trade up for him in the second round. Yeah. I mean, they were aggressive. They were trying everything possible, and they gave up a fifth to move up from 72 to 65 to go get him. And look, he's known as the Yak King for a reason, right? You watch that tape, and granted, it's college. He, he hopefully is a Debo Samuel light, right? And that's a lot of pressure. He needs to learn route running. He'll, you know, I don't think he'll admit it, but I think every scout and analyst said, look, he's great at what he does. He doesn't know the route tree and he can get, he can probably to a certain extent get away with it. I'm sure that'll be something that they're going to work with him like crazy. But you look at what potential he brings to that offense in terms of a gadget type of guy and a guy who can create space, a guy who can create mismatches, a guy who can take it to the house, a guy who doesn't go down and break tackles, and just the mentality that he has, which is probably different than a lot of the other guys they have on that team. I mean, Wilson is no question an alpha dog. Corley strikes me kind of guy who's the same kind of guy who views himself as the best guy on the field and come and get me. That's a guy who, who adds dimension to the roster that was probably lacking before. Oh, well, Malachi Corley makes Garrett Wilson uh, look like a pussycat. So uh, that's the kind of player yep. the Jets are getting, which is why they wanted him. They wanted to add that that personality to the room uh, and to the locker room in general. So I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, by the way, t- to me, the only difference between Bradley and Gibson, the only reason why Gibson played all season and Bradley didn't was special teams. That's it. Mm-hmm. And this is the reason we just brought up Charles. 
Um, and now, does that mean that Brownlee isn't capable of being and stepping into the role now in the second year? Because they were both rookies. So being a second year yep. player, yeah. I mean, I think they believe Jason Brownlee is going to be a part of this team. So uh, we can only hope that the coaches do their job and that these kids are going to step up if needed. Yeah, Corley, I don't see him as like a instant impact guy because of like of what you said. Uh, and we're going to go over the draft in general in just a little bit. Um, so we'll get into that. Um, okay, so uh, they add Travis. We're going to get into that as well. We know the quarterback room, the running back room. It's all about the draft. So we'll get into that on defense. Okay, so they make the move. They trade uh, Franklin Myers, something that kind of caught us off guard, but something that was talked about early process offseason. Who were the guys the Jets could save money with? Here they are, and he was part of that group. The fact that it happened during the draft was a little bit of a surprise. Um, now, what was it done for? I, I guess we're going to wait and see. I don't know. M maybe it's possible that the Jets needed to do something first or maybe some of the teams they were talking to had to do something first in order to uh, open up some space or understand, oh, no, you know what? We, we're not going to get the guy we want. So, yes, now we'll make the move with you. So let's go ahead. Now we can get uh, Franklin Myers because we couldn't get that player in the draft. Maybe that's more likely of what happened. But whatever the case may be. The fact is, uh, is that, and I kind of find it interesting because, you know, I've already uh, looked at Zach Rosenblatt's column and, uh, and I think there are a bit of fans out there that are going to feel the same way. I do not believe that the Jets have a depth problem at edge. I think what they have now is a situation where if they have any injuries, they'll have a depth problem at edge because Will McDonald, say what you want about what he did last year, but... They did not draft him last year where they drafted him to not be an impact player this year. Again, doesn't matter what we think. What they believe is Will McDonald is going to be an impact player. That's why that they were able to unload Franklin Myers and felt that he, in year two, he's now capable of stepping up. He's not going to be Frank, John Franklin Myers in year two, but he's able to make that enough of an improvement that it's going to be easier for them and it's easier for the loss of Franklin Myers. But yes, the only thing now what we have to look at are no rookies. It's all free agency. It's Reddick, it's Kinlaw, and it's Fotu. So regarding that, Kinlaw, look, if he can turn around Kinlaw the way that it, they turned around Thomas, they'll have a good serviceable player. Reddick, this is the big deal. I know we talked about it before, but I think this is one of those things that worked out for the Jets because I think the Jets, you know, we heard about the fact that they wanted to get Shaq Barrett. They wanted to sign Barrett, and they changed his mind at the last minute to go to the Dolphins. I think that worked out perfectly for the Jets because we know why they wanted to do that because they didn't have to give up draft picks and, and, and they didn't have to make a trade to get Reddick. But there's no question Reddick's a better player at this point in his career than Shaq Barrett. It's just not even, it's not even close. So the Jets got themselves a much better player and I think it's going to work out better for them in the long run. So even though they lose Huff and they lose John Franco Myers, Reddick, I think, is going to click. Look, Reddick is a better player than Huff. I don't care what anybody says. So Reddick is an improvement over Huff. And if you even want to wash it out, you can. So bottom line is, I think the question is just going to be, is Will McDonald ready now to take the step? And if he is, I think the defensive line is going to be okay. Yeah, you think about what happened last year, right? So the Jets get jumped for the offensive lineman, right? Which could have changed their strategy this year because if they had gotten the offensive lineman last year, very possible they're not taking the offensive lineman this year. Um, they ended up taking McDonald, right? Who is who is a freak athlete, kind of guy you hope takes that next step forward as you talked about, right? So there's a lot of guys who on this team they're looking to take right next step oh, yeah. forward. Jermaine Johnson, we saw him, we saw him start. To take that oh, next he's going to be a monster year. this year. You I know think, it. I think, I think we both believe yes. he's going to take a massive step oh, yeah. forward, right? Um, Will McDonald, bits and pieces of taking steps forward this year, last year. You're expecting him to take a Johnson-type rise this we year hope. in terms yes. of his playing, right? Michael Clemens has yet to take that step he took, forward. He actually kind of took hoping. a step back last year after a good rookie season. Right, right. You're kind of hoping maybe he takes a little bit jump. Yep. Right. I'm, as you know, I'm a Niners fan. Kinlaw was disappointing in San Francisco. You're hoping, as you said, he gets that Solomon Thomas bump. You're hoping working with Albrick and the defensive line coach here, he takes that step forward. We know what Quinnen is. 
We know, look, we both know what Redick is. Redick is an absolute beast. He's a monster. Yep. He's a sack machine. He's going to want to earn those incentives. And it'll be interesting to see how the Jets manage those incentives in terms of his contract. Um, he's looking to probably show to Philly how big a mistake they made. So he's he's got a little bit of a chip on his shoulder, right? And Solomon Thomas has become the veteran sage presence in the room who's real, who's productive. Look, losing Franklin Myers most certainly hurts, right? Yeah. It hurts their depth. It hurts the room. He was a guy who was a really good player, really good veteran in the room. Uh, unfortunately, as we talked about, there, there are cap constraints that you have. They needed to free up some room. It's a deal that almost got scuttled by the Corley trade, and they had to kind of rework it a little bit. And good for Myers that he got a two-year deal in Denver and extended his contract. Look, I would have loved to kept him. I, I do think it does hurt their depth. It may be something where they're scouring the wire a little bit to try to find a guy who's maybe the right fit systemically associated with kind of the plan and the program that they run, but it does hurt their depth a little bit. And like I said, I was a little surprised in the draft. They didn't try to, again, with all the machinations and moving Joe Douglas was doing and all the picks flying back and forth, I thought maybe one of them, and we'll go through this, they might have used it on a defensive lineman um, as opposed to, let's say, for example, two running backs. No, I agree. I think that's the other spot that we thought that maybe they were going to add one more defensive lineman in the draft and he would be a defensive tackle. Well, it kind of turns out they did add a defensive lineman in the draft, a defensive tackle. It just happened, I used to say, after the draft, which we'll also get in uh, into in just a minute. Yep. The only other player, by and, the and way, I think, I think, and I think we're we're both very happy about the guy that they added. As yes, well. uh, the only other player that's available on the market right now that could be added, uh, probably. I can't imagine this guy is gonna is gonna sign like before September anyway. He'll probably sign in September because he's thirty eight years old. Is Kalias Campbell? He's thirty eight years old. He's played in the Baltimore system, which is, you know, it's 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 a it's a mixed bag. The system it's multiple, so it's not exactly four three three four. So I think Campbell can fit in just about any scheme, uh, and he's played in several other places anyway. But if the Jets feel that they need to add a defensive tackle or just a defensive lineman, period, because let's keep in mind the, the thing that made John Franco Myers valuable was that he was versatile. Even though he was listed as a defensive end, he played more and was more valuable as a pass rushing defensive tackle, interior presence. That's what they lose unless Kinlaw can take the next step. But hey, this is going to be up to the Jets. Maybe they'll get lucky and they'll find out that Kinlaw is the guy. But if they're a little bit worried about that, uh, and they need to add a veteran, uh, then maybe they look uh, at Kalias Campbell. Uh, then you take a look at the linebacker situation. Look, they only used two, so you knew they weren't going to do much there. I was only hoping, now look, maybe Zaire Barnes is ready to take that next step. And what I mean is, is I would like to see Ulbrich be creative and put a linebacker like Barnes or a safety, somebody else on the field who can do some of the cover responsibilities that Quincy Williams had. And I'm not saying all the time, but just can you can give me like an additional 25% this year of Quincy Williams rushing the passer? Because the guy is too explosive of a player to have you just have him running around Covering guys. I'm sorry, but the, we saw what he could do in Denver when he basically got just this much of an opportunity to rush the passer. I just, I'd like to see that a little bit more creativity with Quincy Williams. Yeah, I, I mean, look, to me, honestly, I, I think it's kind of more, while well, I worry about Williams, I think it's more CJ Mosley, right? He was great. He's been good the last year since yeah. he's been healthy, right? He is their captain, he is getting a little older. So you got to hope that he's got really that at least that one more good year because honestly, they don't have a lot in their system no. from a linebacker perspective. Unless they right? and like that, Barnes. And that's one of those that's gaps. It. Yeah. Unless they like Barnes, which we said last year, right? He was a tackling machine, but the question of coverage and everything else. So we'll kind of see what ends up happening. Um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting to kind of see what's going to happen associated with how they get the room down the road, right? We, we, we've got depth in a lot of different spots. I know way early projecting down the road, but that's one of those areas of um, projecting that we think that's going to be something that they focus on potentially next year. And again, they got three young guys, Sherwood, Barnes, and Surratt. So uh, would you only play two linebackers? And then you don't have to have a whole lot of depth there. And finally, in the secondary, they did not do with – basically the only thing they did in the offseason in the secondary was sign Oliver, which was a nice deal, good player, uh, didn't have to spend much to get him. And also re-sign Ashton Davis, which was a very smart move because Davis is a, is a nice depth piece in the secondary. 
Uh, and then come the draft picks, which we'll get into. And who knows about Bernard Converse, because uh, we never really saw him play. He's still on the team. Uh, he's going to have to fight for a job this offseason. I mean, this training camp, because there's a little bit more depth there now. But, uh, yeah, they haven't really did, done anything. But this is the thing that we have to keep in mind, too, is will DJ Reed be here in 2025? I'm not so sure they're going to be able to afford him. So I think a lot of that had to do with the, with the, with the I... pickup of Siggers is hoping that he can maybe replace him in 2025. Uh, Oliver, probably better off as, a, as a, again, a more of a dime kind of back than and a backup corner than anything else. Uh, that's the one thing we have to worry about, but that's for next offseason. My view on this is, I may be the minority, you do whatever you can to sign DJ Reed. Oh, yeah. You pair him and Gardner, and you are set at cornerback for years. I mean, Reed was a brilliant, underrated signing at the time. They probably, as we both think, they got him way under market. He's exceeded that contract substantially. He is a possible all pro, right? We've talked about that before, how good he is and how underrated he was. And you just have the two of them and you're like, I don't have to worry about my corners for a while, right? Uh, barring an injury, right? I think the Stiggers, look, CFL guy. The story's a great story, right? And we'll get into it when we go through the draft. But as nice as that story is, and maybe he starts to pan out this year a little bit and maybe learns the system, he's got a ton to learn, you can take the chance of losing a guy who's that good. And look, we've talked a lot about in the past of signing guys a year early and being aggressive, and they haven't always done that. This is one I hope that maybe maybe Douglas is working behind the scenes and trying to figure out a deal now before he potentially gets to free agency, right? We talked about up the same thing happening, right? We wanted them to sign him two years ago when we saw signs, and unfortunately they didn't. And look, he probably wasn't going to sign because he probably had a figure in mind if he panned out, and that was the big key for him. But I think Reed is the kind of guy who's viewed as they signed him here. I think he likes being here. I think he likes being paired across with Gardner. I think he likes the system. Granted, he's want to get paid. Do it now. Lock him up basically lock Gardner up also pretty soon and, and make sure you have your two corners set for years to come. So that's not a need moving forward, given the type of system that Ulbrich runs. Well, let's also keep in mind that, uh, yeah, uh, in, in about a year, uh, they're going to have to start making some big decisions on that 2022 draft class. So, uh, yep. and uh, that kind of a lot to do with why they added two running backs in this year's draft class. Because uh, you can never have enough depth there in case your number one either goes down or your number one in a year or two decides uh, he's out of my price range and we just can't afford him. So yep. let's let's go through yep. um, let's go through the draft. And I don't so, think we need to go through spe- I don't think we need to go through special teams because it's the same special teams yeah. as last year, which was exceedingly good. And I don't think either one of us have any issues. It's nice to have a kicker. That's reliable. It takes you back to the John Hall days and other guy, Nick Foles when they're like, oh, we'll just replace a kicker every year. No, they finally got smart and said, hey, we got a guy who's a really good kicker who we don't, who wants to be here. We can sign at a relatively reasonable deal. Let's just get him signed and not screw around with this. Yeah, absolutely. And he's not, it's, it's not, he's not even old. You know, as long as he stays healthy, no. he's got a good few years left in the prime of his career. Morstead's getting up there in age, but he did have a really good season last year with the pinning. You know, he's he's, a, he's, a, he's like a defense. He's like an added defender on the team. He's not a uh, he's not like the, the the kid that the Chiefs now signed uh, that we were hoping that the Jets were going to get. That's that's a weapon. Uh, but Morstead is, yep. is, is just an added defensive guy that's going to help you pin teams inside the 20 and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, And also a very good teammate. Made sense that they brought him back. I completely understand why they did. Uh, but we just gotta, I just, I just, if I see that kid have, have become like the greatest punter in the world in Kansas City, uh, it's going to be hard to digest. Okay. I know. I know you wanted him. Yeah. So let's go ahead and go through the, the draft. So... Um, what I'm going to just pop up here so everybody sees as we're going through this. These are excerpts from the 2024 uh, Guide to the NFL Draft uh, at rlads.com. And uh, I could actually show you. This is, so this is what the guide looks like right now. Okay. Now, you can get the PDF form if you want to get it right now. You're listening, you're watching us, and you want to get the PDF form, you can go to rlads.com. Matter of fact, I'll just quickly 
uh, pop that up here so you can check that out. See, this is the depth chart for the Jets over at Ardalads.com. You come up right here, buy draft guide. Can't get easier than that. Click new orders, and there you go. And a very easy process. You got the guide. You got the review guides coming out soon as well. You can do PDF or hard copy. Okay, so uh, now let's get back to uh, the draft. So here we go. Um, and by the way, the Jets did make six trades in all. And the first one was was the one with Minnesota. And, and this just turned out to be just a really beneficial trade. And we talked about this. I mentioned this before the draft last week, that if the Jets were going to uh, get lucky uh, and make a deal like this, hope that there were some of those quarterbacks that were still available. And they certainly were. And Minnesota just, and you know what? People said Denver might might have wanted to make a deal as well, and I can even though the Jets made two deals with Denver, uh, I I just wonder whether or not uh, after what happened with Peyton, it was like, well, we'll give you Zach and we'll give you John Franco Myers, but we're not going to let you get the quarterback that you want. Uh, we're not going to go that far, so we're going to take Minnesota's deal instead of your deal. I don't know if that actually is the thing that happened, but. Uh, the Jets were able to get a couple of decent draft picks for the simple move of moving from 10 to 11. Yeah, I mean, it was a great trade. I mean, Douglas, I think, sold it where there were supposedly other teams that were interested, and that's kind of how he sold it to Minnesota. I mean, he got the two picks, one of which we know was used for Corley, which when I think the trade happened, we both said that, hey, maybe they packaged one of those picks with their third round pick to kind of maybe move up into the second round. They ended up actually getting the first pick of the third round, but they ended up using one of those picks uh, you usually said like they Bowers, according to what everything we hear, was a smokescreen that he wasn't necessarily as high on their draft board as everybody made it seem to be. Whether or not we believe that or not, it's irrespective. They grabbed the offensive lineman because look, I think we both think that they needed the offensive lineman. I don't think oh, there's absolutely. any question. Yeah. They need the offensive lineman for 2025 and going forward. And if he he can become as good as look. The guy who I think we all would love him to be, and he was compared to a little bit from a size perspective, was the Brickishaw Ferguson, right? Similar size, both 6'6", both about 3'10", in that range. Um, really articulate if you listen to him, excited to be here. Um, you kind of listen to him and you kind of get motivated and you get pumped up just listening to him, just the way he handles himself. Kind of guy's even keel, but as we saw in some of his blocks, he can be a mauler and not guys on their rear end also. Um, good quick feet. He's got to get a little better at times with the point of attack, uh, but is a guy who you think is going to grow into the role. And look, if God willing, he becomes the Brickishaw Ferguson, I think all of us will be skipping to the loo to 10 years because Brick was an absolute monster lineman and never basically missed a game in terms of his career here and ended up a all-time Jet. So the goal is that he becomes that, but he most certainly augments and adds to the depth and is a guy who you know is going to get in. And look, the Jets have unfortunately historically had injuries. Tyron Smith has had injuries. Moses is getting older. Unfortunately, Vera Tucker has had injuries. So he's the kind of guy that's going to basically be, hopefully be, maybe not right away, but as the season wears on, a kind of a plug-and-play guy that you can utilize and just slide into the lineup when you need him. Yeah, and again, uh, whether it was Rosenblatt or some others, I heard talking about, uh, well, may maybe you'll see him by midseason uh, replacing Morgan Moses, or uh, uh, you know, th this is going to be the guy that they can rely on. Uh, uh, maybe they could push him and, and let him play guard this season, uh, his rookie year. Look, the Jets are completely set at guard unless there's an injury. Fashano is not playing guard. He's never played guard in college. He ain't playing guard in the NFL in his rookie season unless there's an, a rash of injuries. And he's not replacing Morgan Moses in 2024. You can forget about that. So Fashano is there to learn the first year. To get, if everybody's healthy, he'll get reps, you know, a little rep here, a little rep there. But other than that, this is going to be just, we're going to keep our fingers crossed that this is just a red shirt season for him and we don't need him. Uh, are the chances are he's going to play a few games for Smith based on Smith's injury history? Yeah, but also... How do we know Carter Warren is not going to outplay him this during this camp? And then if there's an injury, that Carter Warren ain't going to start over him. I, I actually hope that's the case. Carter Warren has a whole year on him. So I would hope, or else if he doesn't, then that says Carter Warren's behind as far as his uh, ability to play. So uh, I actually just hope we don't see him this year. But if we do see him, yeah, you're right. There's a lot of hope. And uh, why not? He's the 11th pick in the draft. We better have high expectations for him to be another Dabrikashaw Ferguson. Okay, next up, uh, let's talk about uh, how they handled 
uh, the rest of the draft. So uh, they go into the third round. They make the trade with Carolina, first of all. Um, and uh, this puts him in a position uh, to grab uh, Malachi, Malachi, excuse me, Malachi Corley. So uh, Corley, look, you could even check out some of what is said here in the excerpts from the R Lads Guide. It talks about, uh, I think what's the important thing here is, is this, this, what's talked about right here. 90% of his career in the slot and nearly half of his receptions were behind the line of scrimmage. So that is exactly what you were talking about, Jan. That, yeah, you could also say it's about not knowing the whole route tree. It's another, it's another way of saying that, but that is definitely the case. He's got a lot to learn there. But the question then is, but is really, how, what did the Jets, what, what was on their mind when they grabbed him? Was it about, yeah, we want him to learn the route tree, or do they want him to be a type of receiver that he's being compared to, Debu Samuel? I mean, maybe he's a poor man, slightly poor man's Debu Samuel. If that happens, then yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. He's not a first-round draft pick. He's a third-round draft pick. So I think if we get a poor man's Debu Samuel, I'm satisfied with that. Yeah, I mean, I think... I think the viewpoint was to get explosiveness, right? We talked about, you know, the, the need for explosive plays. And you look at the offense, you got Hall, you got, you got, um, you got Garrett Wilson. Now you add Corley. You have guys who can, A, to a certain extent, take the top off a of defense, right? We've seen Hall when he gets going, he's got full speed. Wilson, in terms of his ability to Hall? get open, doesn't have blazing speed. Hmm? Uh, Bre- oh, you're Bryce, talking about running back. Breeze, Breeze Hall. Running back, right? We talk about guys explosive. Like Mike Williams is a guy who can, when he's healthy, can get down the field and create mismatches and, and do it, right? This is the kind of guy who can create open spaces. And even when there's not open spaces, right? He has no Run problem trying it. to fight yeah. through tackles and bounce off of guys, right? So that's that's an element in terms of a physicality that might have been lacking at times, but he brings it and brings it hard and is a guy who doesn't like going down, which is a great mentality if you have for a guy who's a wide receiver slash running back slash whatever you want to call him but they're going to probably put him in multiple different spots to try to find him open space and utilize that ability to to get open, but utilize the ability to bounce off of tackles or bounce. Oh, granted, look, it's, it's, it's the NFL, not college, right? It's a whole different game now in terms of the level of competition, but you, you like what you see on video, and clearly the Jets most certainly liked what they saw because, as you said, they, they took one of the two picks that they got from the Minnesota trade, and they were trying to move up like crazy yeah. and trying and trying and finally look. They got lucky he slipped all the way down to 65. I use the term slipped in air quotes, but he got into the range where they were able to make a deal. And honestly, giving up only a, only the pick they had to give up was pretty nice in terms of what it gave them the ability to do down the road also. Yeah, again, once uh, the, the, the Jets get, in my mind, a break. Uh, it's clear they got a break where they didn't have to make those trades when they did, and they still were able to get the player they wanted. So that worked out. Okay. So then uh, they made the trades, the three trades in a row. Here we are. We're waiting. The Jets are about to make their pick. We've waited for I don't know how long um, for this to happen here in day three. And then, boom, they trade with Green Bay. Boom, they trade with Detroit. and Boom, they trade with San Francisco. So when are we going to pick? But overall, and we'll get into uh, what they did with some of those uh, moves, uh, the the, the biggest take on that was the fact that they they were able to land – which is probably going to be close to a fourth round pick. If Detroit is as good as we expect them to be Mm -hmm. next year, Uh, it will be a late third round draft pick, uh, which is okay. It's it'll say third. And so that to have an additional third round draft pick next year, just to move down a few spots, that's, that's pretty good. That was also pretty good. And I thought out of those three trades there, I thought that was the thing that stuck out the most to me. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they gave up the fourth to move to get a third next year. Um, and then they made multiple trades, right? And the thing I wanted is we talked about, right, depth in the, def- the depth at um, defensive back. And the guy, T- Tampa, who went to Baltimore, was the guy I was kind of hoping that they were, might land in that range. I thought he would have been a perfect addition um, to the offense, to, to the defensive backfield. Uh, but they ended up obviously sliding down. They went one pick before them. Uh, and then with them, they're making the trades, right? They, they made a couple of interesting picks. One, they ended up getting Braylon Allen in the fourth round. And then ended up getting Jordan Travis in the fifth round and then Isaiah Davis, right? So Allen gives them a different dimension. It's odd. They talk him about him as a physical back, but if you watch his tape, he's really not that physical of a back. He's a physical specimen. 
He's a monster in terms of what he looks like, but he's not the kind of guy where he's kind of you stick him and you're going to need a third and one and you're going to just hand it to him and he's going to run people over. It's not really his game. I but agree. on the flip side, the benefit is he's 20 years old. Yep. He's a kid. And he's a relative baby if I think about it, right? He hit Wisconsin at 17. Highly productive back, coming out of a really good system. Obviously, somebody they can teach and mold and learn. He, he, he wants to be Derrick Henry. Well, guess what? <laughs> you like Derrick Henry? He's your favorite back. Become that physical kind of specimen. But he gives them a whole potentially different kind of look than what you get out of Hall, right? Although Hall, as we've seen, he's, no, he's not a guy who's not willing to stick his nose in there, right? He'll get dirty. He'll beat guys up if he has to, but it gives them a different dimension yeah. with adding Allen as a kind of a back there, right? And that, well, so that's Allen. Yeah. And by the way, I, I agree. He, there's, there's a difference between – because Derrick Henry is, is, is the quintessential – you know, if he's the elite of pushing the pile and being physical, you know, downhill between the tackles runner. Allen would – We'd like to see him become that or close to that. He's never going to be that. But to be that type of guy, he has demonstrated those abilities in college, but he's not just, say, like if, if you know the kid Dylan Johnson from Washington who did not get drafted. Now, that is more in the lines of, hey, you want a guy to come in there and get a yard first down, get a, get a touchdown at the goal line, you put Dylan Johnson in, that's what he's going to do for you. But that's not Braylon Allen. Braylon Allen – as a dimension of being able, he runs downhill. Yes, he does. He is physical. Yes, he is. But that is not his game yet. He's not just that I'm all or nothing downhill physical runner. That's just an element to his game. And to tell you the truth, I don't think that I'd rather just, you know what, keep at being 235. That's probably a little heavy. I don't think he needs to be 235. I think he could lose 10 pounds. I don't need him to be a big bruiser anyway. So just, you know, lose two, lose 10 pounds, be 225. You'll, maybe your speed will because four five seven is not very fast so maybe you'll gain a fraction of a second uh or, or who knows maybe even a second off your 40 if you can lose 10 pounds uh that's that's the kind of player i'd rather you be yeah right. i mean the other guy who i the other guy who i kind of wanted honestly besides was was Jaden hicks right and the jets trading down again and that trade with detroit cost them hicks so i thought also would have been a really nice addition to the defensive backfield the guy who was prep projected to go a lot higher in the draft that slipped and slipped and slipped. And that's one of those guys I thought what it might've been a nice steal in terms of grabbing them where they did when they ended up trading the pick to Detroit. Okay. And then uh, comes the uh, Travis pick. Uh, so that was next. And uh, first you see, this is the trade. Uh, and then uh, the jets uh, go ahead and take uh, tra uh, Travis uh, at round five and this was the spot to take him. They weren't going to take him any earlier than that. Um, so I think round five makes a lot of sense. And, and we, we, we understand uh, if you follow college football, what kind of player he became at Florida State. And it was just a shame that he got hurt when he did. And you could say, I mean, that was a big story in college football because Florida State got robbed. They should have been in the playoffs. They decided the, the committee chose against that because of his injury. So it is what it is. But the fact is, is that, look, uh, I don't see Jordan. Look, he's a fifth round pick for a reason. He's not the guy that as Jet fans, we're going to sit here and go, oh, in two years, he'll be our starter. No, in two years, hopefully he'll develop into a starter. But that's all it is. It's a hope. And at worst case scenario, you have uh, a, a, you know, a good young backup that maybe by next year, if they like what they see, could be the number two to Aaron Rodgers. But more than that, you know, I think that's wishful thinking. But it's nice to have at least a young quarterback on the roster, which is something that I thought was necessary after getting rid of Zach. Yeah, so I think they were looking at Travis, and I think they were looking at Pratt was the other guy they were looking at, right? Travis, if he yeah, had Yeah, very surprised that Pratt lasted as long as he did. Yep, yeah. and that was the other guy that they supposedly potentially were looking at as a development guy. Uh, Travis is a guy who, as you said, they, they got hurt. He probably might have gone earlier if he wasn't coming off the injury, according to some of the projections. We talked, you know, they needed a developmental quarterback as a guy in their system that they view as a guy who could grow into something down the road projecting way beyond the road. Maybe he becomes a solid number two down the road and is not the number one, but they get him in the system. Granted, never a bad thing potentially to sit there and learn from, from Rogers. 
could also learn from Taylor as well. Uh, he's got he's got talent. There's no question he's got talent. I don't think he projects to be a starter. He projects to be a backup. But in the latter part of the fifth round as a developmental quarterback, a guy who you think could develop into something, especially somebody who was projected to go higher and just went lower because of his injury, most certainly worth the risk to take him there. All right. Now, then came uh, the only pick in my mind in the entire draft that was a little bit of a head scratcher. Uh, and that was not the player. It was the position. And that was going for another running back and Isaiah Davis out of South Dakota State. So, uh, look, once you get into the fifth round, it's it, it, it's it's potluck when it comes to these running backs. You hope you made the right move. You hope you grabbed the right player. There was no scouting report on Davis at our lads and on the draft guide. So uh, that shows you, you know, exactly where he was expected to go as more of a seventh round or priority free agent type player. Look, he had, as you can see, just on, on, on some of the stats I threw out there so you can read, uh, he had a very successful career in the FCS. He came up, he, he was big time in the biggest games. He played in a lot of big championship games as a championship uh, 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 champion period, uh, two time in the FCS. So, um, so there's a lot to like there. And as I said before, in my mind, th- there's two reasons you go this way. Uh, there was, by the way, there was a question that was posed to Joe regarding, um, hey, you know, you, you went with all those offensive players early. Was that strategy or did it just work out that way? Douglas said, oh, it just worked out that way. Hogwash. Absolute hogwash. The Jets were intent on adding as many offensive players, especially skill position players, that they could to this roster, through this draft, and that's exactly what they did. Because there were a ton of other guys that the Jets could have got in, in this position, to, uh, especially like you were talking about, you know, it's was it safety, uh, corner, uh, defensive tackle, and all that. And instead, they go offense, and they go running back. So he's basically going to be your number four running back for the next couple of years. Um, and I think the other reason, of course, is uh, what I mentioned before, and that is, you never know if Brees Hall is going to turn out to be the greatest player in the league in a couple of years, and the Jets just can't afford him, and he's going to go. And then now you've got three young backs that you can work with and hope that one of them eventually replaces him. That's part of the reason I think that they go ahead and grab two running backs to have as much young talent back there as possible just in case something like that happens. Yeah, I don't know, Greg, if you're showing stats, but we're still seeing the order form for our lads on the screen, just so you know, in case you needed to switch it over. I wasn't sure if you were planning on showing the X. Oh, for you? As okay, we went I'll make this. it switch for you. Out. Yeah, everybody else could yeah. see it, but not you. Yeah. So I'll make the switch for you. Yeah, thanks. So, so yeah, I mean, again, I think the Davis pick, I think we both talked a little about. I think it is a head scratcher. I just think cognizant of everything you said about Hall, cognizant of everything you said about, you know, them wanting to add more os- offensive depth to me given what we talked about some of the needs for defensive backs and given some of the other needs, there were other guys who, in my opinion, were probably better options there or earlier that they could have utilized as opposed to going for the running back here. And look, the numbers are nice, right? I mean, I don't think that anybody's going to question the numbers, right? And he did it, as you said, FCS, so not necessarily, maybe not against the elite talent, but numbers are numbers, irrespective of who you're facing. But I just think it's odd in terms of where they could have gone and where we think that their needs existed versus what they ended up utilizing the pick. And if, again, as you said, if there is a pick that's mildly questionable, this is probably the one we look at of the whole penelope of everybody to graph and we go, I kind of get it, but I do think there were other better options or other needs that they could have filled or grabbed guys earlier if they were going to grab a back. To maybe potentially, if you're going to use the running back here, then maybe earlier you go with the defensive back, like I said, like the guy who went to Kansas City or certain other guys may have been the guy that they may have gone for. That's all. Yeah, because I, I, I don't believe the Cowboys drafted a running back. And nope. they needed and they a running back. they loved one running back. They had one running back who they had in who everybody thought they were going to take. Yeah. And the guy was there and they ended up, passing on him yeah. and everybody was like uh, you had him in to kind of after we had the surgery what are you guys doing you need a running back so but we've learned not to question jerry jones when it <laughs> comes to things because you're not going to get an answer you're going to like anyway so 
that's a team that needs a running back. The Jets, there's no anybody anywhere that would have had running back as a need for the Jets. And they had two of them. So uh, that's why, you know, it, it, that's the whole, I, 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 the whole deal about best player available had to be part of this. I'm sure he was the top guy listed, best available player. Maybe the next guy was probably so far down that they just said, yeah, this is about adding more and more. If there's an injury, we had dealt with injuries before. Let's just keep adding more talent on offense uh, and, uh, and, and go, go that way. Okay, so then, and the last, they finally go defense with their last two picks. We talked about Stiggers a little bit playing in the CFL last year, so at least he does have some professional experience uh, behind him. Uh, he's got that. He's got the ball skills you're looking for, so that's good. Um, and look, CFL is the CFL, but it is a professional league. And then. Uh, in, the, in round seven, they added Jalen Key out of Alabama. Didn't really do much until his final year with Alabama. Uh, I look at this as really more more like, all right, you get a dime DB who will hopefully succeed on special teams. Um, but that's all I see Key at. Uh, Stiggers is a guy that I think they're going to hope to develop. Like I said, worst case scenario, if they need a starter in 2025, that hopefully Stiggers is capable of being the next man up if they need it. Yeah, I mean, again, it's hard It's hard not to like the pick from an upside potential, as you said. Guy who had stepped away from football for years for family reasons and the story, I mean, everybody can go look at the story, but it's a really nice story. Um, stepped away because of family need, got pushed by to get back into it in terms of, you know, stepping into his mom, got him back into it a little bit, but pushed in, you know, not pushed into it, but got back into it and then became a star in the CFL, rookie of the year. If you're going to take a guy with upside potential, this is the time at the end of the fifth round where you're taking that guy, right? You, you've you addressed needs. You've going to address needs. We both think we need a defensive backfield help. I think they view Stiggers as a guy who could potentially be a guy who could play a little bit in the box periodically, a um, guy who can develop in terms of his skills from a cover perspective. He certainly got the right guys in the room with Gardner and Reed to learn from, right? To be able to That's to learn right. how to become a potentially cover guy. So look, I love this pick is the pick I love. Like I said, if you would have told me that we had gotten Hicks or gotten Tampa and gotten Stiggers, I would be really happy. Key is a guy who, as you said, didn't have the best year at Alabama. I think he's gotten the pedigree. I think the guy who we signed as an undrafted free agent could have been the guy they drafted here instead of Key, but instead we got both of them because they signed him. The defensive lineman, which we'll go into, was probably a really good ad, a guy I think we both liked and we thought probably should have gone maybe in the fifth round where they took the running back. They potentially even could have taken him there because that's the kind of grade he had. You know, it's interesting. I really – I, 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 one day I'd like to find out kind of what's the process of what these guys know about the other third – like as part of the research – is knowing what the other 31 general managers are doing and thinking about. There must be some knowledge there that once you get later in the draft and you start calling guys about whether or not so-and-so will make it through the draft and therefore, hey, you know what? I think Leonard Taylor is not going to get drafted. So, Or, or I, I give him a 10% chance of getting drafted based on the word around the league. So you know what? Let's try to sign him and we'll go draft someone else. There has to be that kind of – it just can't be luck. So, um, But let's get right into it. And, and, and look, all you have to do is Google top college free agents available after the draft, and Leonard Taylor is going to be at the top of the list, no doubt. He was a grade uh, – a second-round grade from our lads. Uh, and the Jets get him uh, as a free agent signing. And the, the biggest reason I, I, I think that they got him there, and, and, and matter of fact, when I was looking over his scouting report, uh, I, I, saw, I saw things like this, shows a high motor. And I thought, well, okay, a guy that he tries hard, I guess. So what's the problem? Well, if you go down here, you do see things where they talk about that his final year wasn't as good as his year before. He does have tools, but there's a, a, a few things that just don't add up about his game and it's going to be all about coaching and that's why the Jets better have good coaches they're going to take their time with this kid and uh, I look at this as a guy though that has is going to have a good chance of sticking on the roster because 
you don't want to you're not going to just throw him on the on on the practice squad because somebody is just going to grab him especially if they hear that he's working out he's developing well so this is a guy that i expect is going to wind up making the final roster as long as he lives up to um what we're hoping he lives up to as the talent uh of a second round uh, draft pick yeah i mean look worth the risk uh, free agent signing, like <laughs> yeah. I said, if you would have told me they took him in the fifth, look, they took him in the fifth round, we might have said, you know, maybe slightly early, but we probably wouldn't have said, you know what, good risk that late, especially where they took him if Absolutely. they took him over Isaiah Davis in the fifth round. Again, I'm not, I'm not, you know, demeaning Davis, but if you had swapped the two and said, hey, we got Davis as an undrafted free agent and, and Watson as a as a guy who was a fifth round, that we probably would have said, yeah, I can live with it, I'm good with it. Um, so in essence, right, they just you kind of view it as interchangeable to a certain extent. And it's worth, you know, it's worth, look, guy who was probably one of the top guys that are out there, he probably saw, look, they just lost John Franklin Miles. There's a potential need on the inside of the line. I'm going to a team where they developed inside line, inside linemen. They developed Albrick system is the kind of guy system that makes linemen excel. You see what happened to Williams. He's seen what happened to other guys. He saw Solomon Thomas take a step forward. He saw John Franklin Myers have a really good good couple of years in that system. Um, who was the guy that went to Houston a couple of years ago? Rankins. I'm drawing a blank on his name. That also Rankins, right? He he came to the Jets, had a really good year, parlayed that into a big contract, right? So if I'm Watson, I'm going, you know what? I'm going to I'm, I'm, telling, I'm going to a team where hey, I, I can potentially learn, develop, and make the roster, and potentially become a not necessarily full time, but a rotational guy, and potentially grow and move into a role down the road. And then they added another player I'm familiar with, being a Michigan fan, is Braden McGregor. Now, McGregor, you just take a look, and, I mean, you look at his wingspan. You look at his height. Uh, he has got elite length for the position. And that is what uh, really used to stick out to me more than anything, watching him play uh, with Michigan the last few years. He played really well down the stretch last year. Of course, they had all those big games, winning a national championship. He's a kid that all he needs is more pro development. And there's no doubt in my mind, as long as he gets developed properly, he is going to be a rotational player in this league. So this is another kid that I think is going to stick on the roster. Uh, because we take a look at, matter of fact, um, if, if I, and I'm just going to pop up the, the depth chart uh right now i don't think you're going to be able to see it but what i'm showing on the depth chart here yeah i can see it okay so what i'm showing I on the depth it. chart here is the fact that look you've got the four you've got the eight that's it yes maybe smart makes the team but he didn't make it last year and remember they had 10 line to make the team last year so that to me i think there was a very good chance that Leonard Taylor and McGregor could both make this team. Very much so. I mean, I think Taylor is a lock is a bad term. I think he has a better shot than McGregor does based upon the tape and based upon his oh, yeah. productivity at least two years ago compared to last year. Um, but you could make a case, right? Tanzo Smart was back and forth and back and forth and yeah. back and forth. And you look at the back end of their defensive line depth. Both of those guys are going to be directly in the mix with these guys to potentially have a shot at making the team. I wouldn't necessarily call any of the guys in the seven through ten spot as favorites per se, based upon what we've seen Ross wise. I mean, you got Johnson, Kinlaw, Williams, Reddick, Clemens, Thomas, um, McDonald. That's seven right there. When you get to eight, nine, and ten, it's it's a crapshoot right now. And you know they love defensive line depth. It's been historical based upon the kind of system that they run. So those yep. two guys will get every chance in the world to potentially make the roster. Yeah, because look, which is probably I, what sold them on signing, honestly. Yeah, because they looked at it and said, you know what, we got a realistic shot at making this team. We'll, we'll, we'll and, and again on a team that has a shot to be good. Let's go, you know, let's go there and attempt to to make, to make the roster. And and look, talent wise, I think uh, McGregor and uh, Taylor have more talent than uh, Lucky Fotu. Uh, so. Uh, not, not to say that Fotu ain't going to be a part of their team this year, but that's just the point is is that uh, they're going to have not only a chance to make the team this year, but be a part of the defensive rotation uh, for the next several years. Okay, so in closing, um, I wanted to bring up the fact that so they did not, no, they did add three three new players to the secondary, Key Stiggers and Oliver. 
Uh, we have no idea about Bernard Converse, what type of player he's going to be. Um, but overall, um, let's say there's another injury because hey, Chuck Clark hasn't played it down yet for, for this team. And we have to just keep our fingers crossed that he comes back and he's going to play, be the player that we expected. Um, and, 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 and I know Tony Adams and the, the, the play, the team loves him and all. We just, hey, hopefully he sticks as, as, and keeps playing like a starter and he's the guy, but let's keep in mind. There are about six viable safeties that are available in free agency. Now, a couple of them are former jets. So I would probably say they're not coming back. And that includes Jamal Adams and Marcus May. But you've got Justin Simmons is still a free agent. You have Micah Hyde. You have Quandre Diggs. And you have Gibson, uh, who was with the Niners uh, just last year. I think just last year. I don't know if he's been with them in the last two years. But um, so there are some guys out there that, you know, I, I would probably keep an eye on in case they feel like they need to add another safety um, because right now they would be relying on, you know, Davis and Eccles and Oliver. Those are your top three veteran backups. And again, I'm fine with Davis. Eccles is okay. Oliver's solid. But then after that, you've got a lot of inexperience. So, um, and, and, and jobs are going to be won, of course, on special teams once you start talking about uh, numbers like that, you know, the 8th DB, the ninth DB, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, Adams took a major step forward, and I think, I know, I'll put this nicely as I can, you had been highly critical of Ashton Davis in the past, and rightfully so, but I do think he showed some signs last year yep. of panning into a, if, at least a rotational guy who can be utilized, and, and look, them bringing him back was, I think, a smart move because I think the gains we saw last year, we hope they can carry forward because I think the first couple of years were most certainly rough for him, but he, he definitely took a step forward last year compared to what we had seen in the past to be a solid rotational player. All right. Overall grade for the draft because you gave a B plus for the off season. Probably B plus also. I mean, look, love the outfit. Look, the offensive line pick was a smart pick. I, I think we both agree that I would have loved the home run hitter. But I think getting Adumatu in terms of when you pair it with getting Corley, right, that kind of becomes that yeah. home run guy. You look at the two of them together, it makes the pick of the offensive lineman in the first round look even smarter based upon what you were able to grab. Well, that's, um, that's what we I talked about became... like a, a month or so ago was that there was so much depth at wide receiver in this draft that you had to go offensive line first. Because you were going to be able to get a right wide receiver like Corley in a second or third round, which is exactly how it played out. All right, and Fashano is a guy who, look, the upside potential is no certainly there. He he's talked about look, he's really only played a position, but he's talked about he thinks he has the ability to play multiple positions if needed and can fill in where needed, which is something that's going to be critical on this team given <laughs> we hope who, not. who they added and the injury risk associated yeah. with it. Um, look, getting Corley, look, you know, I was all in for Corley, right? When, oh, yeah. when they got to that third round, and again, even like well, obviously I wasn't watching, but when I, when I told you, I said Monday night, I said, you know, Thursday night, I said, the guy I really want is Corley. I'd love them to get Corley. I said to you Friday afternoon, and I was very happy to find out when I got the paper Saturday morning that they had gotten him. And then obviously Joe Douglas went a little trade happy yesterday, um, to say the least, in terms of bouncing back and forth and up and down and moving all around. Um, getting the third rounder next year, or even though it was a late third rounder and upping around from the fourth to the third is nice because it gives you additional capital to utilize next year if you need to kind of trade. Uh, like I said, I would have gone for Hicks in the in the fourth round as a guy I probably would have added. I thought they should have added him that he went there. I thought TJ Tampa was the other guy. Um, didn't have a problem with Braylon Adam given what they've gotten. The Isaiah Davis pick, um, met on. Loved the Jordan Travis pick as a developmental quarterback. We said they had to add somebody. We both thought, I think, Davis, Travis, or Pratt was going to be the guy they added. They had the other one. Stiggers, you know, wasn't the guy I think that was on either one of our radars. But if you think about a guy who's potentially got upside, look, you're any guy who didn't go to college but played in the CFL and a whole different system. But you and I both know how wacky offenses are in the CFL. And if you can be a decent yeah. cornerback there, it's all that while room. it may not always translate, the skills, right, the skills are definitely something you can carry forward. So it's an interesting guy. Um Look, the, the Mr. Irrelevant is 
Mr. Irrelevant to me to a certain extent until we see. I don't think he was particularly great, but I think we both love Taylor. I think we're both pretty happy with Taylor. I think we think McGregor's got a shot in Grant, and I don't think we're overrating um, Taylor, but I do think I do think we believe that he's a guy who, like I said, if you had told me he had been taken over Davis, I think both of us would have been, okay, that yeah. works for me. I like the pick there. Yeah. So to get him as a UDFA and add him to the defensive line mix that we think is okay. So me, I give him probably – B, but closer to probably the B plus right. Like I said, the Davis pick is a little head scratcher. I think the multiple trades and not getting the guy who I thought maybe Tampa or Hicks and depends on what's going to happen with those guys. Cause I do think getting that cornerback or safety dead over nice, they made up for it by getting stiggers. Um, and we'll see what happens with, you know, with getting key as your Mr. Irrelevant. Um, I would have loved to use it on something else, but maybe, maybe the, maybe the pedigree of playing for Alabama will end up projecting him forward to be a guy we can utilize down the road. And who knows, maybe they see something in Bernard Converse that says we don't need to go out and draft a guy like Hicks. So again, there's a lot of young players on this team that we don't know. We haven't seen them play. They know. And it's uh, we're going to find out this season. Those guys that were drafted last year, we're going to find out uh, whether or not they're going to take that jump this year because that's, that's, that's what it's about. You know, you have to you have to draft, coach, develop, and we got to hope that these guys come through for them. Okay, so that'll wrap it up. Oh, wait, wait, hold on. I've given I've gi- I've given you my grade. Now it's your grade. Uh, overall grade, I would say I, I like it. I like uh, I like B plus A minus. I'm good with that. Um, because okay. of the fact that. You know, they had only seven picks, so it wasn't like uh, with all the moves they had, it wasn't like they had ten guys. They, they had seven picks. So they basically had to pick a round if you want to look at it. And uh, and, and yet, there were as, I thought they had solid players added, but there, there, it's not like they added a guy where we're like, oh, this guy's can't miss. Oh, this guy's going to be so awesome. They wouldn't get that guy. So it's all up to development. It's up to scouting. Um, and I thought they scouted well. And then I also have to add in the fact that uh, to get both Taylor and McGregor uh, after the draft, that has to be part of it. Um, so it's mm-hmm. almost like they had eight or nine draft picks in all, uh, not just seven. So, yeah, I, I would say B plus, A minus. Okay. okay. So uh, we will see. All, all I, I will end with to say is this, as I said in the very beginning. I think when you take a look at the depth chart and you go through every position and you look at the backups – I think this is we've had more depth now than ever before on the Joe Douglas Jets. It's taken him, which is which is what you should have when you've been here for whatever however long Joe's been here for. It's 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 now long enough time that because remember when he got here there was bad depth. We had terrible depth on this roster. It was bad. So now he has finally built a a, a team that has depth and a team that should be able to sustain normal rates of injuries in the NFL. As long as we don't have anything crazy like what happened last year where you lose your entire offensive line, basically, and your your franchise quarterback for the year. As long as that doesn't happen, uh, I think our depth right now and a lot of young players, I think there's a lot to be excited about for 2024, barring uh, a catastrophe of injuries. So, so I, think, I think, so my view at least right now is, Given what they've done in the offseason, given what they've done, obviously, free agency in the draft, given what's gone on with the other teams around them in their division, they need to contend to win that division, right? Buffalo is a vastly worse team, in our, my opinion. Yeah, they've gone down. We know that New England New England is most certainly in a rebuild mode, yep. right? Miami, Miami is going to be there, but you need to be contending to win this division. Like Agreed. that, like the gauntlet is thrown down now. This is where you, this is what your goal at a minimum needs to be, right? Granted, it's a leap from where they were last year. And granted, as we've talked about, right? Injuries is a huge component of it. But given the roster and given what we both think right now, I think it's kind of, you better be contending for the division at the end of the season. And worst case scenario, you make the playoffs, and that's it. There, there cannot, there right. cannot be Correct. a season next season with Aaron Rodgers healthy for the entire season, and then and barring any major rash of injuries, there is not, there's nothing that I don't want any excuse. It's playoffs at the very least. So yep, because if yep. That, that doesn't happen, then something's wrong with the, with the man on, that's leading the team. I don't think he's the problem, and he's going to finally get a chance next year to prove it. 
if everybody stays healthy and uh yeah so it's all there in front of us so um i'm just not going to get overly excited we did that last year and now it's just going to be wait no, I'm, not, I'm not jumping up and down but i'm just saying i think we both have the viewpoint of given what we've seen that needs to be the expectation absolutely absolutely all right, so we'll talk more about the Jets, uh, that's for sure, between now and the beginning of the season. So uh, as Jen mentioned before, you've got the rookie mini camp coming up. You've got the mini camps, training camp, and so forth. Uh, don't forget, as I mentioned before, the r Lads draft review guide will be out in June. So i got to get working on that. I have 11 teams that I cover for the uh, draft guide, Jets being one of them. So I have to get working on that. And that will be out in June. So check that out. That's an important uh, piece of the literature at our lads each year. And we'll be talking about it definitely in the next couple of months as we update the Jets. Jan and I will talk more about the Jets between now and training camp for sure. And uh, hopefully no news is good news. So at this point, let's just hope that it's a quiet summer leading up into uh, training camp. Uh, and then we can uh, talk more about that at that time. So, Jan, appreciate uh, your time as always. And uh, good luck uh, with your teams in the playoffs and hockey and basketball. Yep. And uh, good yep. luck with your Mets. It's a fun, it's a fun, time. It's a fun, it's a fun time in New York. Uh, came back and uh, won today in the 11th inning. So they're 14 and 13. So up and down, but after an 0-5 start. Clearly a lot better than it could be. Okay. Um, but yes, Jet MSG is a fun place these days right now, given what's going on. All right. So we'll talk more Jets football here on Jets FM, on EOFN, our lads, football network, Prime Sports Network YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. And uh, questions, comments, uh, share with us what you, what's on your mind. What do you think about the draft? What do you think about our coverage of it? And we'll talk to you guys next time.